Mommy Track Daddy Whispers podcast is now called Birth Agni podcast. Welcome to Mommy Track Daddy Whispers podcast season 3. and i found that this culture of force feeding and wanting the chubby baby but a skinny adult and this general lack of awareness about child nutrition and solids it was still prevalent so here we are in 2020 and we're still stuck in the same paradigm of wanting a chubby kid and a skinny adult so i felt like i needed an ally right from the beginning and had my husband on board so that the main issues in child nutrition come from an information gap So it's not that someone wants to do the wrong thing it's just that they don't have the right information Hello my name is Divya and today we are discussing how to approach nutrition for children that is what should go on a plate how to make meal times easier with Nidhi Yadav a certified child nutrition educator with certifications from UNICEF Cornell and Stanford But before if you are a regular listener drop us a rating on Spotify yes you can now rate us there or give us a review on Apple Podcasts or hit us with the heart button or like button on any other application that you're listening to us from helps us get found and uh, today's episode is about of the parenting theme for season 3 and i have plans keeping the parenting episodes now as separate series releasing every month on a specific date so that was an announcement that i wanted to do and more on this to follow soon so let us now get talking to nidhi hi nidhi welcome to the show hey hi divya thanks for having me yeah and uh, we were discussing yesterday how our first conversation was just like we've known each other for so long i think that's what happens when mothers go about talking I know right it's like a mom club we all have the same issues and 90% of the time we have the same solutions to these problems so even if we're talking to a mom for the first time it's like we're part of the same tribe and everything just flows right and andi uh, you've been in this uh, space of nutrition for quite a time now and when we talk about nutritionists and when we talk about say fitness experts or even even parenting coaches for that matter we think they have a magic wand and we think they kind of have it easy okay their son would sit peacefully or their daughter will you know sit peacefully would not throw any tantrums <laughs> so what is your take on that that's an illusion <laughs> trust me every single mom on the planet no matter if you're an expert if you've spent 10 years educating yourself about just how to use a spoon every single child is the same same in the way that they're so individual and autonomous at a certain age that it's impossible to have them follow a set pattern but no matter how many um theories and research and proven points that you come up with they'll throw a curveball and everything goes out of the window so in my case especially if you think my son eats everything and eats every meal uh, that's just not true you have to see him around a boiled egg uh, it's a scene out of a comedy movie he runs away he screams because he can't stand the sight of a boiled egg so yeah no one's perfect everyone is on a journey and it's fun to be on the journey together absolutely so um uh, nidhi uh, coming from this where did the entire concept or where did the entire conversation about nutrition came into um, you know our mainstream conversation if i have to say so for me personally i've always struggled with body image issues growing up i could never figure out where did i fit in in terms of the way i looked or what i ate um i went to a boarding school that was a hard time for me as well and when i consciously tried to trace the origin of where all this began this the very issue of my body image uh, and these thoughts that were in my head i found that a lot of it started with the narrative that i was a very picky eater as a kid so i've always heard horror stories of how i would not eat anything till about age 3 and i would go days without eating and 
after age three, all of a sudden, I started eating so much because I had lost touch with my inner cues of hunger and fullness. Um, that I did get to an unhealthy weight at a point in life, and then I dug deeper, and I was like, how how did it come to be that way? And I was born in the nineties. Uh, it was in the sixties, uh, <laughs> and I found that this culture of force feeding. and wanting with chubby baby but a skinny adult and this general lack of awareness about child nutrition and solid that is still prevalent so here we are in 2020 and we are still stuck in the same paradigm of wanting a chubby kid and a skinny adult so before my husband and i decided to have a child we sat down and had this conversation that we should consciously start researching nutrition and how to introduce solids and have it set in our minds that this is going to be a journey we'll have to be on together not in different stages um and yeah that's where it started this entire journey towards child nutrition and that's how the conversation started for me and snowballed into certifications and more research and helping friends and helping family and eventually helping more moms and uh, maybe coming from what you just said we often draw from our experiences and that's how we start where we want to make change in our lives and then it uh spirals out into our families and then eventually you know you 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 started your own club and you you helping so many people out there and i particularly want to emphasize on the point where you said uh, i i wanted it to be a journey for both me and my husband so it's more of a family affair uh, would you, would you elaborate on that how do you uh, you know advocate that in the indian paradigm it's never as isolated as just the mother or just the mother and father of the child um a huge part of the dynamic is also the grandparents and often people who live in the house um share the same house with us we have joint families we have visitors who come in often everyone has an opinion for sure uh, so um a huge part of making any decision especially about nutrition is balancing these acts so i felt like i needed an ally right from the beginning and had my husband on board so that ha- the, the main issues in child nutrition come from an information gap so it's not that someone wants to do the wrong thing it's just that they don't have the right information right. and by arming him with the right information and giving him enough time to absorb that information before we even had thought about having a child um i think i gave him enough time and space to actually come to terms with what i would want in the future and it's something i uh, aggressively promote in my starting solids class as well i tell i tell moms that you should encourage your husband to join in and i can let them join the class from another location if that's possible because even grandmothers have attended my sessions and it's it's nice to see that when you have a club when you have a village supporting you when you're trying to do something it gets that much easier parenting can never be solo it gets very hard to do it without a village and if you share this information i give a special handout for in-laws and grandparents during my classes if you share this information with them they might get on board and actually support you in this journey and that dissonance of not knowing what the new research says compared to what they grew up with uh, it's a nice way to bridge that gap the other day we were talking about how your approach and how i've seen your stories and uh, you know your instagram page and how I, how i absolutely love the fact that you go from uh, you know you go about talking nutrition from an emotional standpoint the way we 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 we're going in our conversation rather than ingredients and in the in the, in the age that we live today there is a lot of um, emphasis especially in the social media space uh, with so many people talking about you know uh, that their awareness coming in that nutrition is important parenting with an emotional standpoint empathy is important so we have that emphasis somewhere going into ingredients so uh, like i told you I've, i'm seeing a lot of chia seeds everywhere i'm like i never saw chia seeds <laughs> i don't know what they are so, so the deal i i where we lose the plot Uh, in the nutrition storyline especially for kids is the information that is being put out is very western uh, oriented it's oriented 
towards the west it comes from the west that, that's where most of the research is happening yeah. um these are things that are easily available in and around them at present uh, even if they are not native uh, there is a huge amount of lobbying and uh, various other financial factors which bring these ingredients to the fore in the western countries what gets left behind as i said the gap in information is information and respect for our local ingredients so remember how everyone went gaga over ghee a while back and everyone wanted to know the trend of ghee um yeah. <laughs> so what what happens is it's it's just that there is no peer reviewed literature there is very little in fact peer reviewed literature about our native and regional foods but when you look at um, the local foods that we have we have sabja seeds we have flax seeds alsi um we have so many nuts and seeds all over the region uh, north south east west everyone has a different version we've got sesame seed alu up in the hills we've got our gajak chikki yeah. down here in the north down south we have amazing podis and uh, masala chutneys and so many different things um i i love all the gujarati snacks which which are so loaded with protein and flavor Yeah. um and what happens is uh, while we are following these trends not because we want to follow the trends but because that's what the media and everything around us is telling that's what the information is this gap on in information um leads us to believe that we must put chia seeds in everything our child eats yeah when in fact you could just be making a normal coconut chutney with your dosa and it does just as much or if you're making a besan chila it's already got the protein in it you don't need to chase it with chia seeds and hemp seeds on top um if you're making something as simple as idli with podi uh, it's already got lentils in it it's got sesame seeds in it might have peanuts in it it's already got everything that you need it's even got some ghee which is a healthy fat and will help the body absorb the fat soluble vitamins and uh, while we are busy chasing what the media and the information around us is feeding us we lose out on what we already know yeah so what i emphasize is that you must stick to what your family culture food culture is what your local food culture is eat local eat regional as much as possible yeah and you 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 told us about all these dishes and what i could really get from what you said is you talked a lot about combination and talking about science so how we the food or uh, seeing a lot of food bloggers or these chefs out there are talking about food is science food is science so these combinations that have already existed there must be some science some logic behind it the way they are there and probably um, and i'm i'm sure you are the expert to tell us uh, how that goes about but now when we are focusing so much on ingredients protein macronutrients mm-hmm. and all of that do we also in an attempt to get all of that on the plate sometimes you know are creating our own version of combinations it may not be wrong but uh-huh uh, there may be some amount of balance that we are losing out here uh, am, am i right in asking you this question or um that that's actually a very complex question and it's yeah. so um, <laughs> i think i there are a few different ways to look look at it um the approach that i use with my clients most of my personal clients a lot of them are based around canada uk the us some in the middle east and saying local ingredients and food culture gets very dissociated because they don't have in- indian ingredients yeah. out there yeah but their food culture is inherently indian so mm-hmm. how to merge local ingredients into their food culture is somewhere where the combination about ingredients and macros and say for example you're based in the US and the government is telling you one fourth of your plate must be fruits at every meal yeah. um because each country has their own guidelines what i personally suggest is um sticking to the basics all right um look at your plate not just as calories or macros or just the micronutrients but also look at the emotions and the history behind it so every lentil dish that is prepared in india be it sambar be it dal be it uh, any sort of gravy uh, 
anywhere across any region they all have some sort of um, vitamin c rich ingredient present in them inherently right the recipe calls for it yeah. so you'll have tamarind yeah. you'll have kokum you'll have amchur anar dana you might have a squeeze of lime or some tomatoes in the dish yeah. and now when you look at the research western research uh, scientific research that comes out it says if you eat an iron rich food with a vitamin c rich food it helps the absorption of iron so they say if you're serving beans serve some strawberries with it but you don't need to serve strawberries with your beans you're already putting anar dana and tomato in your rajma so uh, i always ask everyone that if your uh, local ingredients do not are not in conjunction with your family food culture it's it's completely fine to merge the two now someone who follows ayurveda might say that we cannot eat fruits with milk mm. and someone who's following a more western approach might just make a smoothie of the two and that completely <laughs> goes against each other's beliefs uh and in, in this case it's best to again look inwards and see what works for you as a family i wouldn't taking religious regional emotional and cultural uh, sentiments into account i would not say one is wrong and one is right it is important to look inwards and decide what works best for you as a family right and it might right. be a middle ground or it might be one of the two extreme but that's a decision you have to make for yourself yeah and i think uh, you answered my question there when you said when you already have all of the the right combination in the lentil that you're having the lentil soup that you're having why why add strawberry to it why add anything else that you don't is need big? it just yeah. just look inwards look at what your grandmother cooks look at what your what your mama cooks and you'll probably find the answer look at what your dad cooks you'll find the answer right there yeah and um talking about emotional eating and cultural eating we as a culture in india emphasize we are an agricultural land um, you know uh, the 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 milk you know uh, the milk is something oh, that yeah. that that's of extreme importance right from the ch- uh, child is born um, a baby is born we focus on um we want the child to have the cow's milk when we are you know transitioning from uh, the mother's milk onto solids and everything Uh, sometimes and i think most of the time <laughs> a lot of us do not like milk i have never yeah. liked milk growing up but then I, yeah, i i hate milk yeah my daughter hates milk and um someone on the line i respect that she she doesn't like it but there's always Thank that <laughs> but there's always that pressure on us as family you know i i am like okay but not everybody in my family is okay and that you know can come in the way of um, um the way uh, food is presented on a plate from a, a, a cultural or an emotional standpoint it's it's a process it's 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 an arrangement where you eat not just what's there on the plate for how it's being assimilated in the body it, you know we are we are physiological beings i think i'm already answering the question but um uh, what i wanted to ask is uh, milk is such a huge thing in india and sometimes like i've been forced to have milk in the morning before i go to school i know all my life i was told if you you're not well have milk you don't get anything have milk and uh, i know i asked my brother early in the morning you finish my milk because i cannot do it because i i i don't I like it remember this yeah yeah so uh, i would do the same yeah well, this, this brings up a, a, all the recess trauma we have about milk i think we both are going really deep into our traumas right now <laughs> Probably, <laughs> which is why I um, I prefer not to be. So, uh, is it yeah. focusing on uh, one food item and then forcing it on somebody, um, a, a child, from a nutrition standpoint? Not just from a nutrition perspective, but looking at the broader perspective, um, and the things that we are trying to teach our kids now uh, about bodily bodily autonomy and. Um, good touch bad touch how their body is only theirs when you're forcing a child to eat or drink something you're essentially teaching them that your body is not yours and i have more authority over it than you do that is such a sad thing so in a way you're infringing on the very truth that you're trying to instill in their minds so it sends a very confusing message um i would say if 
if you're teaching them that their body is only theirs from a safety perspective you've taught them good touch bad touch then please do not force them to eat or drink anything emotionally it is just as scarring as forcing a hug or a kiss yeah. because it infringes upon your right as a human being it teaches them that no matter how you feel it's my authority that counts and you must submit to it so um forcing a child to do anything in terms of food or drink it does not add any nutritional value of course if there is a medical case where the doctor feels certain interventions are necessary forcing is not the way to go they you have specialists i i am a primary educator in terms of child nutrition if your child you feel is lacking in certain nutrients and you're forcing the milk on them for nutritional needs if you feel it's fulfilling a nutritional need it would be best to talk to a specialist and chart out a plan which acknowledges and solves the problem in a more holistic manner rather than creating trauma for your child which would a not solve the problem and b snowball into more problems later on we need to reassess our attitude towards milk the per capita milk intake before the milk revolution was only 240 ml per person per capita so it's only after the milk revolution the white revolution that all of a sudden everyone wants to drink milk milk more milk more milk for the kids it wasn't there before the milk revolution it's relatively new to our culture uh, of course since we don't look at it documented that way and we are directly oral history is told that we used to have n ml n liters of milk a day and your father used to have n liters of milk a day the oral history doesn't it's anecdotal it is not evidence based and it doesn't paint a clear picture of how much milk was actually consumed way back in history as per ayurveda as per our cultural history it paints a very myopic view of how much milk is the right amount of milk and probably advertising just the way we know so many things uh, that we know exist has been because they've been advertised like that uh, completely completely and um so from a nutritional point uh, standpoint when you talked about milk uh, is it also like a lot of us are allergic to milk a lot of us we don't know even uh, babies can be colic and can be may not be able to digest human milk as well i mean uh, the ratio is less but uh, it can happen so f- would you would you also caution uh, parents uh, that if your child does not like milk it's also their body telling them that it it doesn't suit them so should that also be respected in that way definitely uh, it's very important to let our children cue into their bodily cues of hunger fullness liking something or not liking it and we need to respect the decisions that they make in this regard and i have a pretty flexible view regarding animal milk um so technically the upper limit is 450 ml a day you should not be consuming more than that per day for children and there is no lower limit so it ranges the spectrum is from 0 ml to 450 ml and all of them are right there is no wrong answer here okay. so if your child is not drinking milk entirely not drinking milk that's okay you can fill, fill these nutritional needs through food if your child is only drinking 10 ml of milk a day that's fine too 200 ml 100 ml 300 400 450 all are fine one is not better than the other and in so, any form any form so this the 450 ml includes milk which should ideally be whole milk not uh, toned milk is fine as as it is sold in india no skim milk no double toned milk buffalo milk is fine cow milk is fine and um, this includes milk and lassi or buttermilk if you consume that and dahi and if you're serving paneer it includes that too okay so there is a whole range if your child doesn't have milk uh, in Very, equal yeah. form and if they have curd and if they have paneer they already having it so we can definitely a paneer slice of cheese um dahi all counts towards or dahi as a hunkered dip or a spread all counts towards their dairy intake and it really does add up during the day yeah and this must be such a relaxation to a lot of parents out there who who are bombarded with you know uh, suggestions that if a child is not drinking milk they're losing on to something and a lot of kids love 
curd as i've seen uh, a lot of children love curd and they're okay with paneer so that raise i think a lot of us would be relaxed and oh, also putting in a very um poopy perspective <laughs> if your child is constipated very frequently the number one cause is milk uh. so yeah I, i see a lot of children come to me when they're suffering from constipation and their parents are wondering if they need to up their fiber intake if they need to up their fruit intake or if they should try prune juice and the first thing i always advise is check how much milk not just milk dairy and dairy products are you consuming through the day and if it's close to 450 ml bring it down to 400 and if it's close to 400 and your child is still constipated cut down another 50 ml and see uh, this entirely came from personal experience and then i dove into the research and found found out how connect, connected milk is to constipation because of the high calcium content for us the sweet spot is 350 ml 50 ml over 350 and i, I know we're going to have a bad day in mm-hmm. tummy day Yeah. So uh yeah milk is not just all good if you overdo it it can be pretty bad it can hinder iron absorption your body will not absorb enough iron you'll be anemic uh iron is a top priority for children it should be higher up the priority list than milk or calcium any day uh, the same goes for tummy issues like constipation if your child is constipated he will he or she will not eat well will not have a have an appetite for the next meal and unless you're cutting down on milk uh, don't expect the issue to fix itself that's the first step that you should be taking is cutting down on milk and seeing if that helps sometimes it's just the calcium overload holding them back i think that that's that's a good amount of information for us to understand things not from just one emotional perspective probably that we like our generations were told and that's like anecdotally uh, you know orally is coming forward to us so rely on the child's intuition rely on your own intuition your own history if you don't like it and if your children don't like it uh we can very well based on all the information that you've given all the facts that you've laid down for us we can very well leave it at that so uh, nidhi my next question uh, to you would be um now again uh, the plate I mean I'm circling back to what we discussed. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we are uh, when we look at the plate, we uh, I personally usually have just one kind of food. So it's dal chawal, so it's dal chawal. I'll either have a little bit of char or something like that. And um uh, so what we cook and that's how I thought I'll do when I was expecting because I thought it's it'll be easier for me. That was the only, you know, uh, motivation behind making sure that i serve what's there in my kitchen that's it uh, she she can uh, want to experiment she can go wherever she goes she eats what's there what we what we eat there so uh, but these days again we see that there's a lot of focus on having a lot of uh, different kind of stuff on the plate so that when a child doesn't eat one thing uh, goes on to the other so can have something else i have not done it um and yes it it does happen sometimes when i have to you know my my daughter tells me i don't want to eat this then i have to ask her what else would you like uh, and sometimes it uh, becomes a problem because she doesn't know what she wants and um so w- how do you think one should go about when they're serving their children there's there's this rule i follow uh, never let kids pick the menu yeah and i i say that because if i let my son pick the menu every day it would be plain rice for all all three meals a day uh, so that's why it's it's something it's, it's there's a lot of research that has gone in behind this concept it's called division of responsibility um it's by ellen satter and what it says is children they're not equipped to make the decision of what goes on the plate they don't know what a balanced meal looks like so what you do is you divide the responsibilities between you and your child so that you have a, you have this clarity regarding who is responsible for what the parent you get to decide what you put on the plate all right and once you've decided what you put on the plate it's the child's decision to pick what they want to eat from the plate if they want to eat fr- from the plate and how much of what do they want to eat from the plate so say for example you've served dal rice and dal rice mixed together 
so your job here is done you've done your part in serving a balanced meal it's got carbs it's got proteins it's got some vegetables in the chunk and you've done a good job you've made a balanced meal you know that your child usually eats dal rice so it's not not something that they're scared of and uh, now it's the child decision entirely if they want to eat only the rice or only the dal or on, dal rice mixed together if they choose not to eat any of them that's fine too we have to, we have to listen to what they say we have to acknowledge their feelings uh, towards the food and uh, if if you usually serve a backup food my advice to all parents is serve the backup food at the beginning of the meal on the plate itself for the first few days your child might just eat the curd rice and not touch the rest of the food but when you bring out the backup food later you're taking away the opportunity to learn if you do not give them the opportunity to learn and interact with their food and feel safe that i don't need to reject this meal in order to get curd rice it is already a part of the menu they'll feel safe enough to step out of their comfort zone and maybe try the other food so always have a safe food on the plate and as i said you're in charge of the menu decide what goes on the plate but keep their preferences in mind when you design the plate yeah, you take a step forward and let them take another step forward so that we Definitely. come to and anithi we are seeing um, there are a lot of uh, channels all the chef the food channels that have specific channels for kids food and they are all colorful different kinds laid out in all the different ways a beetroot added to everything for color uh, as if the child would reject everything that you make at <laughs> home so a lot of us go into the illusion that we need to prepare exclusively for the child do you think uh, that is a good strategy at all i think it's a strategy that that might help you get back on track if you're already off track if you if you're trying to get your child to interact with food in the first place if your child is not at all interacting with food and it can be a part of a very um, so all the rainbow foods that are around these days they can be part of an organized plan where you're trying to get your child to interact with food if they've lost touch with food entirely it can be part of the strategy but it cannot be the entire strategy i ideally you begin solids with your child and you serve them modified family meals even if you're starting with purees pick something from the family meal space say for example if the family is eating loki and roti and you want to serve a puree to your child you're going the traditional weaning way do a loki and roti puree right with ghee or some jeera in it start with family foods right from the beginning if you're doing baby led weaning give them loki cooked long and some strips of roti to go along with it it does not have to be fancy it does not have to be broccoli florets it does not have to be beetroot cut into flowers for them to eat it the goal with food should always be to have your child eating family meals with the family and enjoying the family food and culture if you begin with cooking entirely different meals for your child you cannot expect them to turn 1 year old or 2 years old and snap and turn into this person who randomly starts eating everything that you eat if you have only served broccoli florets your child will not eat aloo gobhi ki sabzi mm-hmm. you should have served aloo gobhi to begin with mm-hmm. um So yeah, the rain, rainbow foods can be a stepping stone towards food acceptance, but they cannot be the entire strategy around which you prepare your child's meals. And your child is not the focus of your life. Your child is the is a part of your life. You can't spend your day making perfect bento boxes unless you're doing it for Instagram. <laughs> um, it, it really isn't practical. I, I've served my son bread crusts, and I've served him. His snack today was leftover curry chawal from lunch because he entirely rejected lunch, and I think to a person who is not familiar with curry chawal as a food, it would seem rather unappealing. This coagulated mass of yeah. yellow gravy and rice with three splotches on top, but to him it was delicious as a snack. He he did not need a packet of chips or a box of cookies or anything for snack today because he had skipped lunch. He was hungry. 
I know he didn't skip it because he doesn't he hates the food or the way it looks. He just skipped it because he was not hungry. And come around snack time, he was hungry again. So the sooner you mold your child into what your family food is, the easier it would be for them to accept that, even if it is all colored with haldi. Um, <laughs> so pretty much everything is yellow, right? Um, and that's completely fine. When they say eat the rainbow, it has more to do with the nutrients that each color brings. So ah, okay. we do eat the rainbow, except it's cooked and colored with haldi. Yeah, it's yellow, <laughs> mostly yeah. for most of our food. Yeah, the nutrients are there. The colors are not. <laughs> Got it. Uh, and Nidhi, um, when a child rejects a food, like you said, it may not mean that the child does not like the food. It can be that they're not hungry at that point in time, and they may have the same food later. But sometimes we are so focused on feeding the child and sometimes we also want to you know respectfully feed the child but we think that they rejected it probably for the first few instances uh, if something is served for the first time you may think that okay they rejected they don't like it in those circumstances we may overdo bring lots of you know options so that they eat right there and then what is the strategy what, what is the way that one should go about i remember one of your posts where you said you know when a child doesn't want to have something it may not mean that they don't really like it they just don't want to have it right there so you serve it time and again how 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 do, how does that work food repetition has a lot of science peer reviewed research and statistics behind it and what this research has brought to the fore is that most parents stop serving a food after 6 to 7 rejection so your child rejects it once you say oh i must serve it again because i saw a post on instagram saying that and you serve it again and your child rejects it again and you try five times six times seven times and then you stop because you tried right like you didn't do anything wrong but what the research shows is that most parents stop after the seventh six to seventh time but food acceptance comes closer to 15 to 30 times of times after exposure so the motto should be to not stop and always have it on the plate even if your child doesn't like it now in exposure doesn't have to be a huge amount say for example your child does not enjoy bhindi ki sabzi and uh, you've been putting like a ladle full of it on the plate every time and your child never touches it no it, it can be just one single piece of bhindi ki sabzi on the plate that's an exposure and your child might not touch it five times 10 times 15 times maybe the 30th time your child might pick it and throw it on your face believe it or not that's a step towards eating <laughs> your child interacted with the food yeah um so you've got an interaction that's a step in the right direction that's what i tell most parents do not give up on food if your child does not like it keep it on the plate if it's on the family menu and your child doesn't like it put a little piece on the child's plate they are free to remove it from the plate and put it away they are free to remove it and put it on mama's plate on the table in the no thank you bowl but put it there on the plate don't take away the opportunity to learn no i think that's a learning for me because when i want to serve, serve her something and i think uh, i'll only serve her that thing so you know it, it does come back for rejection like i said and then i have to think of her comfort food uh, which i serve her because she'll have that So I think that's a that's a great learning for me to uh, when I want to introduce something new, say bindi or uh, loki ki sabzi, anything like that. I should actually start with small and let her um, pick it up. So it it has a chance that she sticks to it longer than rejecting it because I'm forcing it on her. Another way to go about it is to make the interaction. stress free or pressure free so when this loki or any food comes to their plate on the table at meal time the pressure even though you don't say it with words the pressure is present they know that if it's on their plate they're expected to eat it and that pressure can keep them from trying that new food what you can do in such cases is to take away the pressure take away the power of the dining table the plate and the meal meal time and actually interact with loki or whatever food that you're working on outside of the meal so give them a full loki let them play with it be a sabzi wala wash the loki peel the loki 
or if you've got some leftover loki sabzi give them a fork in their play area on a plate and tell them can you smash the loki smash 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 and get them to interact with it for play and not to eat and that might help them overcome that initial fear that they have of trying it they have these preconceived notions in their head will it be squishy will it be crunchy they've never touched it felt it they're so confused by it and interacting with the food outside of meal time might take away that pressure and help them be comfortable around the food that's a great advice going to start that now <laughs> and uh, nidhi uh, there's a lot of uh, like i also think the need for nutrition is so important these days because there is a lot of packaged food not even for children for us to that is being sold in the name of healthy so even well well meaning uh, guests would come with a box of juice because it's healthy and uh, a child is given oh it's it's just juice um uh, but we as parents may sometimes you know have our uh, <laughs> you know um red flags raised okay how do we but it's it's not in our culture it's mean it's considered mean to say don't really do it how do we put a handle onto it if something is presented if something is right in front of the child to say no to it to regulate it how how should one approach a condition like that we we want them to have these internal cues where they recognize do i want to eat this food or not that's the long term goal all right and pro- processed food it's part of our reality we cannot run away from it in our urban scenario it it is everywhere they will go to school they will go to birthday parties they will go off to college yeah. um <laughs> and yeah so we want them to have these internal cues where they recognize what do they want and does their body need it and how much of it does their body need uh so restricting their food choices in in the present might work for now but it is not a long term solution so you can tell your child beta don't drink this juice or you can tell your child beta you'll get only one cookie but what about the time when your child is at chachi's house and there's an entire box of cookies and no one to say no yeah right uh, we want them to have these internal uh, this inside voice telling them my tummy is full i needed only two cookies i don't need to eat the third one mm-hmm. or my tummy is very hungry i did not eat lunch today maybe i need four cookies today and we need to respect that voice that comes from within and this is something you need to build on every day little by little it doesn't come in a day as i said i've struggled with my own food related and body image issues and uh, to have them recognize their hunger and fullness cues is the long term goal with junk food as we label it i i personally am against labels of junk food and healthy food and it is a part of our curriculum our kids curriculum in school in in cbse icse uh, it have assessed both the curriculums and it is there the issue with labeling a food as healthy or junk is that it puts the onus of the decision and the guilt of having eaten it on the child where in fact the shopping and the purchasing yeah. of food is being done Good by true. an adult they can't yeah. go to the supermarket and buy an apple yeah. when they have something else around so we cannot label food as healthy or junk for young kids we can tell them food gives us energy it gives us calories different foods provide different levels of energy just like you charge your phone you need to charge your body and your body needs fuel like a car now you need to decide which food energy do you need today say for example if you're going to play with your cousins play in the park you know you'll need energy but for a long time so maybe we eat something protein rich that is protein rich and that way you'll have energy for longer but as if you eat just a cookie and run away you might have a lot of energy to begin with but you won't have energy long enough your batteries charge long enough to get through with play um a good way to handle junk when out and about or if if someone brings it high calorie foods and self junk let's call them mm-hmm. high calorie food a good way to handle them is to put them on the menu <laughs> that's that's really the easiest way so say for example you get a box of 12 juice packets and your child wants to of course drink all 12 juice packets the first day itself tell them okay we'll put juice on the menu this is on the menu today and put one juice on the menu for the next day snack time and another for the next and another for the next and as you keep doing this there will be a point where your child says no oh, juice is nothing special you know maybe maybe i don't need to gulp it down at once maybe one sip is enough 
um yeah and that and that's how you work on each and every food that that you that is high calorie so if you, if your child is obsessed with cookies or milk bikis or chocolate or candy anything really anything that you put on a pedestal if anything that you try to restrict gets put on a pedestal it's something so special what is this thing that mama doesn't want me to have or papa doesn't want me to have so take that power away normalize the food serve it as part of the menu give it a place on the menu and see where that takes you you'll be surprised yeah exactly and um a very important takeaway for me uh, from what you just uh, talked about is build a relationship with food food is the need to survive food is not just taste and flavor it is of course but like you said giving them examples of you need energy so you need food and i to be very honest have never really uh, in the last 3 years have really looked at food from that perspective and have not really introduced or expressed food from that perspective it's all it's always okay she'll get hungry somewhere when we're going out we will will carry this but it's it's such a in such an important takeaway okay so i think uh, i'd ask you not really related but a question that most of us want to do because it it brings about certain boundary uh, or uh, brings about schedule and discipline in our children should giving food to children be timed the human body it thrives on predictability so even as adults as children if we have our meals at the same time our body knows when to relieve digestive juices it knows when to send the hunger cues if the food hasn't been provided at the same time uh the body also needs to make sure that it is getting the next meal because it does not want to go into this scarcity mindset where the body thinks i don't know when the next meal is coming so your body releases stress hormones and you're stressed out about the fact that nutrition is imminent so our bodies are designed to survive look back back at history prehistoric times it's all about survival we are designed to survive our minds uh, have this one goal in mind which is survival and if the food is not provided at predictable interval the body does feel confused so while it's not important to time the meals you don't have to do breakfast at 6 am every day there needs to be a schedule to it say for example your child woke up at 7:30 today wakes up at 7 on other days maybe at 6:30 on other days so breakfast is 1 hour after waking up yeah. uh have a schedule around meals so 1 hour after waking up is breakfast 2 hours after that is a snack and maybe lunch is before the nap or after the nap in case there is no nap say lunches mm-hmm. before quiet time or before tv time have a schedule in place so that way toddlers especially this age group of uh, yeah you, you you have to see them they hate unpredictability yeah they despise it so yeah. if their schedules are predictable they thrive and it makes parenting all the more easy you know when you know that your child will not be begging for snacks all day because they know they will get a snack after tv time it happens every day after tv time yeah it's predictable and probably they they'll also security yeah so i to cut you down probably they also ask for it but if they do not know when what is going to happen sometimes they start creating fuss and trauma on to something else because they are just so confused what's 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 the problem that's happening so it it has happened with me sometimes when she doesn't realize that she's hungry uh she she throws a tantrum she wants to go out she wants to do this so so i i i i realize okay now she's doing this probably she wants this but then again like you said uh, i mean i would want you to continue uh, on what you were saying about predictability that cuts down on those unnecessary tantrums that they may throw so hangry is a real state of mind <laughs> i i've been exactly. hangry more than once yeah <laughs> we know what hangry is um so yeah that, that, that actually stems from your blood sugar so if your blood sugar is stable you will not be hangry and that's where predictable snacks at regular intervals come in um this this is a very nuanced 
best way of looking at it but when you look at diabetic the the problem is that the blood sugar spikes and drops and spikes and it needs to be constant is the is the aim in maintaining the health of a person with that diabetes it's the same for us the more stable we keep our blood sugar the more stable will the mood be and it's the same for children if you provide them balanced snacks and meals balanced being something that contains a grain some protein some fat some fruits or vegetables uh the blood sugar will be stable through the day and that does help regulate the mood a lot yeah. you'll be surprised at how adding a balanced snack can totally transform a child's mood yeah yeah the the day the day divi is full and she has not really like she's not gone out she did not have uh, her friend coming in at at a point where in her regular schedule was to eat and then she got involved into something else so the, the days that she has been eating throughout have been really really patient and have been such a relief for me so i think before uh, we let you go i would like to ask you um uh, but one of the last questions what is that one most common question that you get from your clients that you may want to you know share with us uh, tell our listeners oh my god it, it has to be my child just doesn't eat <laughs> right yeah. uh, and we all say that we say oh a child just doesn't eat and part of it is just cultural we love saying that out in public yeah uh, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah being our relatives modest. want us to say that so yeah. that they can give unsolicited advice on how you should start ragi and that will increase the appetite or iron drops are needed and things yeah. like that um but in fact it it mostly in in the indian cultural context it stems from two things the first of course is my my nemesis milk <laughs> so if your child is having too much milk they're consuming all their calories in liquid form why interact with food which has different temperature texture flavor every time when you can get your and even put in the effort of chewing when you can get your calories in a predictable manner from a smooth consistent sweet liquid right yeah. so your child will have an affinity for milk um instead of food so that's when i say cap the milk and you'll see changes gradually and the second most common problem why this question comes up is unmet expectation so parents feel that the child must eat one roti or one and a half roti because my sister in law's child eats this much and mine doesn't eat this much when in reality if you look at portion sizes for a child they're vastly different from what we think they're supposed to look like one fourth of a roti is one entire grain portion for them so they're not supposed to eat one roti they're supposed to eat one fourth of a roti <laughs> it's your expectations which are out of balance entirely your expectations are wrong same goes for dal or sabzi it's one tablespoon of dal and one tablespoon of sabzi that's that's the right portion for them for a meal and we expect them to finish an entire katori of dal or uh, an entire spoonful of sabzi a needle full of sabzi that's not going to happen because that's just not the right portion for them they're tiny creatures they're tiny tummy So yeah that that's the most common question i get and it's a very fixable issue <laughs> yeah and probably uh, with all the information with all the social media and with all the you know conversations that are very important but sometimes they're taken um, the, the focus gets changed and therein comes a control we all want control uh, i i would also admit that i despite wanting to you know be as patient be as respectful sometimes land up into this uh, you know voluntary need to have some control and you know to want uh, our children to behave in a certain pattern because we've all grown up in that kind of an environment so it becomes a very reactionary uh, process for us uh it's uh, very hard to unlearn patterns that we grew up with it's a very conscious effort to unlearn these patterns yeah and i end up saying the same lines that i've heard grown up so no matter how yeah. much we you know you know think that we may not use the same language uh we are very comfortable uh we do i i do sometimes and i notice that because because it's important to notice that for me so it's very important like you said to remember uh, 
to have certain take a step forward let the child take a step forward and have a good relationship with food rather than just to have it for nutrition really thank you so much and also remember that you as a parent were not given any class any coaching any manual on how to feed a child yeah so if you're on a journey of your own you're you're acknowledging the way you feel when you say certain things and that's brilliant uh, that's a realization that doesn't come easy it's a very conscious effort on your part remember that you're not at fault because you don't have the information um yeah. it's just the information gap and uh, the best thing that you can do is fill in that gap in information and yeah give yourself some grace because you're learning too it's not just the child yeah that, that that's that's a wonderful way to end our episode on on that note that we are all learning we are all you know trying to do our best from the place that we come we all have different experiences different learnings different information sources so be easy and um, learn learn as much as possible thank you so much nadi for coming on thank board. you for having me today yeah. thank you it was wonderful talking to you That was pretty much all about nutrition for your children. Scheduling meal times for them or whether or not to have elaborate meals for them. I hope this answers some of your doubts and questions. If not, send them over to me on my email ID mommytrackdaddywhispers@gmail.com. The name of the show at the rate gmail.com. Like always, I look forward to hearing from you. Next up on season 3 would be an episode with a prenatal postnatal physiotherapist. This is a part of our series on physical health before and after pregnancy and how you should approach it. And next on the pregnancy series we have what is a natural birth. With that I take a leave. Bye bye. See you next. Remember, you got the part. Stay tuned.